Okay, so now why don't we talk about bones and inflammatory disease of the shoulder. So, uh, uh, Ram, what do you think of this case? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, speaking of the back. That's right. Got it well there. Uh, so it looks like we got a frontal chest and a infant, newborn. Um, markedly abnormal appearance to uh, the osseous structures, pretty much diffusely, particularly in the bilateral proximal humeral heads. We're seeing, uh, yeah, osteogenesis. So let's go into bone trauma. <laughs> okay. So, <coughs> Michael, here's a 16 year old male, right shoulder pain for three months after a hockey injury. Okay. Um, we have a single AP view of the shoulder. Humeral head looks okay. I think that it's, I don't think it's dislocated. I only have one view. Um, oh, okay. So some irregularity of the um, distal clavicle and the AC joint. What's this? Uh, I think that's just a, well, it's only 16 years old, so I, I think that's just an apophysis for now, but it could be. If it doesn't fuse later, we can consider osochromialy. And we have two axial views of the shoulder show um, a lot of signal abnormality in the distal clavicle, and the clavicle looks foreshortened. There's a widening of the joint space here and some edema as well. So my differential would include so after, after an injury. Okay. All this foreshortening and the distal clavicle looks so irregular. I'm considering... Um, like a bony resorption after an injury. So it could be a little, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it does look very irregular. So I, yeah, so considering like an osteolysis or bony resorption there at the distal clavicle. So in this case, on the left non-injured side, you can see a nice, smooth, normal distal clavicle. On the right side, you can see where it's been resorbed. There is some widening of the joint space, just said, like you said. And you can see the two signs. So this is post-traumatic osteolysis. And the uh, two common things which do this are rheumatoid arthritis and trauma. So, Susie. There's abnormal signal intensity within the left sternoclavicular joint. Um, it looks like it's maybe he's undergone um, separation or like maybe a little yeah, I don't think it's totally dislocated oops now I do <laughs> so he's dislocated his um, sternocolicular joint well not dislocated but so it's my tendon, there's a sternal yeah but on the other one I thought it was sternocolicular now it's not it's like more like a hit from the new breed from, um, First ribbon and new brain. Yeah. First journal ribbon. Looks like we got cor coronal views of the in the through the level of the sternoclavicular joint. Um, once again we're seeing some fluid intensity at the uh, joint between the distal clavicle and the and the manubrium that seems to be extending into the first rib as well. I wonder if there's some kind of car cartilag cartilaginous tear yeah, there. So, so, this is, right. so, so this is a fracture through the cartilage there. And you can see both the uh, sternal manubrium and first rib manubrium uh, are uh, unstable at this point where the cartilage has been fractured. You can see the normal on the opposite side and a lot of the, the marrow edema here. And these things really are, uh, they don't heal as well as you would think, even in young people. And you can have persistent symptoms here for a long time for it to heal. Here's just another case after a soccer injury, a blow to the chest, and we can see another similar type uh, injury. So 
No, they're not coming. Here's a 46-year-old male stroke in clavicular pain for six months after trauma. Michael, what do you think of this case? So here we see the left clavicle looks like it's subluxed superiorly with respect to the right, and there's a lot of surrounding edema and maybe a little bit of a cortical defect along the inferior margin too. So I think this is probably a sternal clavicular, oh, this is six months post, at least a sternal clavicular separation and chronic instability. Okay. So if it doesn't heal properly, you can end up with a chronic instability there and a chronic pain syndrome. So it's important to make the diagnosis in the acute stage and treat it properly. Susie. In your history, left anterior neck pain, background of eczema. And so the left, um, that is the left, and I think that is general clavicular. It looks a little bit fuzzy on the whole joint. Maybe even a little bit, um, yeah, it's nice and sharp, and it's not nice and sharp on the other side. So, sclerosis and erosions. And then on the MRI imaging, you can see the abnormal signal intensity within the sternum. Oh my gosh. And now we're looking at post contrast studies. And there's, you know, some abnormal enhancement along the edge there. So I'm wondering again if that's um, erosion, zebranation, osteolysis, or if that goes along with her. It's an osteoarthropathy related to her eczema. Uh, psoriatic arthritis. Oh, Safo syndrome. What is the Safo syndrome? synovitis, acne, pustulosis, hyperostosis, and osteitis. You have to think about in people who have skin disease and multiple manifestations of osteitis is the Ilocephalo syndrome. You can also see it in the certain negative arthropathies. That was a that was a patient who ended up with the diagnosis of a Safo syndrome. Okay, Haram. Uh, So, 58-year-old with sternal pain after two-week injury by being hit by electric car. So, coronal images through the sternum and manubrium and sagittal images. Um, I guess the, the, what stands out here is the, the, the cartilage, the, stern, the rib cartilage is dark. I don't know why it should be so dark, so it would make me think it's ossified probably or calcified, densely calcified. Hmm, okay, yeah, that's true. Um, in that case, I wonder if that's the that signal in the lower sternum is, is real. It's actually really edema. So, yeah, it looks like it's confirmed there. Your first, first consideration would be just trauma, that the patient have trauma to that area. And basically, is having trabecular bone injury to the sternum. From yeah, there's a direct, there's a history of trauma. So, I think that would be the. Okay, this happened to be my wife, and it, this happened about two years ago, and she's still symptomatic from this. She's getting better very slowly, but it's still not normal. And uh, some people believe with direct blows to the sternum like that, you can occasionally get arrhythmias. Actually, actually uh, can uh, very rarely. You can get acute so arrhythmias that can even lead to death, but that I think is more of a fiction of the movies than anything else. But uh, some people believe that. You have no things happening to your wife. I know she's great. She, she's a, a very good subject to have for <laughs> musculoskeletal lectures. Okay, Michael. So you're a 22 year old male with costal chondral pain. So the coronal images through the sternal and manubrio joint um, looking at probably the first the second rib on the left and yeah probably the second rib at the costochondral junction there's increased signal there um, yeah so 
Also some increased signal maybe surrounding it. Yeah, it's a costochondral junction injury. Um, probably traumatic, I would suppose, in, in this young male. I don't see any. Oh, it's heat syndrome. So it's asymptomatic. Okay. Oh, good. That's great, then. Why don't you look it up and tell us what it is tomorrow? Okay. All right. So a lot of these syndromes, you know, you know, internal medicine, I always talk, costochondritis and so forth. But I think that costochondritis is, again, one of those misnomers. It's not really, most of it's not inflammatory, and most of it is post-traumatic. But why don't you tell us what TC syndrome is tomorrow? Oop. But you can tell us more. And this may be a true inflammatory lesion. Okay. So why don't we go on and talk... Uh, <coughs> Uh, a little bit about little league shoulder. The uh, this is just to point out that one of the biggest problems, and I think we've talked about this before in little league sports, are the parents, not the kids, or anyone else. And uh, often uh, it's the the kids being pushed by by uh, their coaches and their parents, which actually lead to some uh, pretty horrendous injuries in these little kids. And we've even tried doing studies, but it's been actually difficult. We're trying to do studies in Little League uh, players because if you actually try to prove that MR can lead to improved prognosis in a lot of patients, then you have to use the information in MR to change the behavior of the patients. And it turns out with Little League players, if you tell them that they've got an injury that could be career injuring if they don't stop and rest it, we'll talk more about this in the elbow where we've tried to do studies, then typically the response from the parent, not so much the kid, is, well, if you're going to tell me that, then I'll go to a different doctor. So uh, the biggest problem often is, is treating the patients with these little kids. So let's go through some of the injuries that we typically see, and these are all due to overuse in the immature skeleton. So this is the paper in uh, the American Journal of Sports Medicine, which kind of defined the, the concept of the Little League shoulder. And here you can see uh, this, uh, these are different shoulders, but this is a typical appearance where we're starting to see lysis ad adjacent to the growth plate uh, here and in this location, two different patients in their article. Uh, or actually, no, it's the same patient, two different projections, I'm sorry. Uh, and as you know, in kids, we've talked about this before, the weakest link in the locomotor unit, the locomotor unit being the, uh, <clears throat> the bone, growth plate, epiphysis, tendon insertion, muscle, tendon, uh, epiphysis, growth plate, and bone again. And then the muscle contracts and it moves the two bones together. That entire unit is really the locomotor unit. The weakest point in kids when their physes are still open is the thesial plate. The bone is stronger, the tendon is stronger, the muscle. After the growth plate closes, then the muscle tends to be the, the weaker link. So in the late teens, early 20s, we see a lot of muscle. Problems. And then when you get into older people, uh, younger adults who are athletes or older normal individuals, what happens is you start getting degenerative changes of the tendons, which we call tendinosis, and then the tendons become the, the weak link in the, in the cascade. <clears throat> so what do we see with MR? So it's what you see basically with plain films is that you see evidence of separation of the growth plate where you really have a fracture of the growth plate. And then you can get a lot of hypertrophic changes as the body tries to heal this in the presence of ongoing trauma. And that's really the hallmark of a little league shoulder. Uh, here's a 16-year-old pitcher with shoulder pain. What you can see here, and you can compare this to other fecial plates, but this fecial plate is thickened a little bit, much more irregular than it should be. And we can actually see marrow edema adjacent to the, the growth plate. And you have to see these to see the difference because you, know, you, you tend to get increased signal intensity adjacent to normal growth plates, but the normal growth plate wouldn't be this irregular and you wouldn't have as much edema as we see in this particular case. And here, this is also really, it's, it's, a, uh, it's really a non-displaced salter fracture of, of the growth plate. But, but these tend to be in kids that have ongoing 
uh, exercise, so you'll start seeing hypertrophic changes as the body tries to heal it. Uh, if you take them out of sports and let it heal, then, then, then these will heal very readily. But the problem is convincing the parents to let the kids stop playing. As people often say, well, it's the kid who's the problem. But if it hurts, most kids want to stop. It's really more the parents and the, uh, and the coaches that are the problem. So here's a 15-year-old male, right shoulder pain, uh, especially with throwing for two months. And here we can see the plain films. This is even more severe than in that case that was, that was published in the article. This is from Dr. Su in uh, South Korea. And you can see the marked thickening of the growth plate here. Uh, marked irregularity with that little telltale uh, calcification like we saw in the other. Here's the MR scan, grossly abnormal growth plate, a lot of fluid collection here, very irregular margins, uh, so definitely abnormal. So what do you see with the little league shoulder? Uh, you see fecial widening, cystic changes adjacent to the metaphysis, and bone marrow edema. And that's just stress reaction. And here it is healing after it was allowed to rest. So there are various terms, osteochondrosis, the proximal stress fracture, proximal humor epiphysiolysis. Uh, I basically, I think it should be just called a fracture, a growth plate fracture. And uh, if you use that term, then people tend to take it more seriously than if you use a lot of these other terms that kind of mask the severity of the, of the abnormality. And it's just due to repeated stress. Now, what happens if they don't rest it? Do they eventually okay. the, the If they don't the rest it, it can get worse until you can actually get a displaced fracture. We'll see more exa examples of that. Uh, typically, the shoulder becomes such a problem that they, they just can't continue with their sports anymore. Uh, we'll see more of this in the elbow, where you can, well, I'll show you some examples of displaced fecial fractures and so forth, where, where they're a little bit more common. And then, so here's now there are some other uh, tip uh, other typical injuries besides the fecial plate. So the fecial plate uh, fracture is the uh, original description in the little league shoulder, but there are other areas where you can get overuse syndromes as well. This is one from Philip Tierman, and if you look here, you can actually see that there's abnormal signal intensity within the subchondral bone of the uh, glenoid, and it, this typically is a superior glenoid. And here we can see it occurring right right in this location. And here again, we can see abnormal signal in the subchondral bone of the glenoid, again due to repetitive trauma, repetitive glenoid impaction. And this tends to occur, in my experience, in the later teens and the early 20s. I've seen it in a few Major League Baseball players, but this is a pretty rare injury at, at that level. It's more in the high school uh, uh, baseball programs. Okay, let's go to some, some other abnormalities here. Oops. Okay. Susie, what do you think of this case? <laughs> okay. There is abnormal signal intensity along the greater tuberosity. There may be a little bit of fragmentation of the bone there, so that would be going along with your greater tuberosity fracture. Hi, Sean. Okay, now there are, there are really two ways to get this kind of a fracture. One is a direct uh, trauma impaction. And we, uh, I've seen that often in uh, skiers, where they'll fall, come down right on their shoulder. Uh, my son actually had a fracture just like this from, from that mechanism. Or you can get it in older individuals that have weakened bones. You can get it from, from acute traction of the supraspinatus, where you get an avulsion fracture uh, there. And you can also see that in younger people as well. So the main thing to look for is a displaced fragment here. If it's displaced too far, as we'll uh, think we've seen before, if not, we might see it now, you can actually get enough displaced bone, and if it heals, you can develop a significant impingement syndrome. 
uh, which I think we talked about under impingement syndrome. So you, you want to check for that. Uh, typically, you want to allow, you want to limit the amount of traction on the supraspinatus until this heals, but so that you don't get a displaced fracture with these kind of greater tuberosity fractures. So what is the, the what, what, how do you stress your supraspinatus out that much? I mean, it's just kind of, isn't the, but it's a pretty, I mean, it's only that initial, isn't the supraspinatus just you use it initially to kind of get up, then the deltoid takes over. So, or, 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 uh, really kind of explosive, uh, 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 retraction of the supraspinatus and then you know you can have you can have people who are kind of weightlifters and so forth who have very strong supraspinatuses and if they get caught off balance where all of a sudden the body has this uh, reactive jerk where it, where it maximally contracts the supraspinatus you can pull off the bone that way too uh michael oh no uh aram what do you think of this case So two, two axle views of the shoulder. So there looks like there's a, are we, I think, yeah, we're posteriorly dislocated with a, looks like a locked impaction fracture with a, of the posterior humeral head on the posterior corner of the, or the anterior humeral head on the posterior corner of the glenoid. There's some hypertrophic bone though, posterior to it, which I'm not sure what we're catching there. So this is typically an impaction from the front. You fall down, impacted fracture. It fractures the posterior glenoid. And at the same time, you get a reverse heel sax impaction injury. So this one isn't a complete dislocation like we saw in the posterior dislocations. This is one where you, you basically fracture both bones. And it's an impaction fracture. And uh, here's another fracture we can see here. Now, uh, Sean, when you say a four-part fracture of the humerus, uh, what does that mean? Um, I believe it means um, you've got a fracture of like the lesser and greater uh, um, tuberosities and a transverse fracture uh, through the surgical neck. And then the, potentially there's a displacement or rotation of one of the fragments. Yeah, you have that. But you know, basically, it means that you can see four bone fragments uh, when you fracture it. And this was a common uh, two-part, three-part, four-part fractures, each one progressively more severe and difficult to treat, is, is the classic way to describe fractures of the proximal humerus using plane films. Now, with MR, people are kind of getting away from, from doing that because we actually find that they're much more complex than the what you see on plane films. And now you, you, you basically need to describe where the fracture is, uh, where the primary fracture fissures are, where there's, there's any displacement. Here we can see it's involving the surgical neck as well as the uh, anatomic neck and, uh, and in, any offsets like this and impaction. Uh, so, and then you need to describe where it involves insertion of the major, major uh, tendons, because again, that you have to worry about the potential for displacement over time. Uh, so, <clears throat> so now I think the main thing is to just have a good description on the MR examination. And most people are getting away from using the, the old classification because it's just not sophisticated enough for what we see on an MR examination. So this is the, uh, the near classification. Uh, one part, two part, three part, four part, and with progressively more displacement, rotation, and so forth. And then there, there are uh, another of other components. We have avulsions, and then obviously uh, the, the the more hill sacks type injuries and so forth. But I think now with with MR, it turns out that a lot of these blend into one another. Uh, so, at least in my experience with MR now, people are getting more into just describing the, dif the, the different components rather than using the near classification itself.
And so here again, we can see a uh, comminuted fracture with displacement and rotation of the distal fragments. And it's kind of best just to, to describe it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Susie, what do you think of this case? Okay. Um, first of all, the humeral head, it, it looks like it's totally, it's totally fractured and below the inferior glenoid. Head is, yeah, the head is decapitated. And then along the um, lateral margin of the humerus, it looks like there's another fracture line. If you move your right through there. And then I'm not sure about that little piece of bone that, that you were first circling right there, where that's coming from. Is that one of the tuberosities or not? Because then there's also another fracture line coming through that piece of bone right through, right below there. To the greater tubercle. Okay, that's probably greater tubercle. Then there's a lot of um, blood and blood breakdown products within the joint um, space. Oh my so heavens! Good is here, so he can ask you how you treat it. So, anyway. so this is basically each fragment was attached to a separate tendon in the rotator cuff and all were retracted back by the, by the various tendons. Okay, don't forget core cord fractures. These are kind of easy to overlook, especially in kids where actually this is a normal physis. This is the fracture, and you have a normal physis that isn't in the fracture is more comminuted, and it's really kind of a, uh, a uh, Salter Harris type fracture but involving the physis of the core cord process. Again, you just need to describe it. Okay. Sean, what do you think of this case? Um, it looks like there's a fracture through the uh, humeral head. And there's widening of the um, fracture margins. And although it's hard to so you, you know, the, I guess you'd be concerned with, uh, as the slide said, non-union. Um, there's yeah. looks like there is some sclerosis on each side of the fracture margins, which yeah. would, would go yeah. along with it. Right. And the, the term non-union is something you have to be very careful of because I, uh, in order to really be comfortable this non-union, you need to have a history that the fracture has been there for some time mm -hmm. and there's been an attempt to heal it. And you really like to see even more sclerosis at the margins than this. Uh, th this one was, was a very chronic fracture. So some people, Different people would tell you different amounts of time periods. Some people will say three months. Some will say six months. I even know some people that don't want you to use the term non-union until it's been there for nine months. Uh, and the, the reason that typically orthopedic surgeons don't like you to use the term non-union is because it, it has an implication that it's been treated inappropriately to allow it to be there, whether it has or not. So it's best not to use the term non-union. I actually put it here just to, to remind me to say this. I think it's better to describe the findings. And if you see sclerotic margins, and these aren't all that sclerotic, but if you see very sclerotic margins, uh, then uh, you'd imply that it's, that, it's a, that it's a chronic fracture. And uh, I think it's best, especially if you don't know the orthopedic surgeon very well that you're working with, before you use the term non-union, I would talk to them about it and make sure you're on the same page before you put that term in a report. So what could be, go what could be going on there? If we're not going to use the term non-union in, in a case like this, is the assumption then there's fibrous tissue and whatnot, scar tissue bridging that, that fracture, and therefore there may actually be a union? <clears throat> no, this was indeed a non-union. Uh, <clears throat> but... <clears throat> <laughs> Typically, what keeps bones from healing is motion. So there are characteristic locations where if you get a fracture, there's a high risk for non-union. The scaphoid waste is one. The base of the fifth, if you have a Jones fracture on the foot, is one. The characteristics locations that, and they really all, what they have in common is that in normal motion, there are high strains there which lead to motion if you get a fracture in that location. <clears throat> uh, 
So generally it means if you get a non-union and non-healing, typically it means that the treatment has not provided sufficient stability to the bone to allow healing to occur. <clears throat> uh, and that's why nowadays, as opposed to many years ago, nowadays for those areas where it's known that there's a high risk for non-union, the treatment is typically a, a surgical treatment to internally fix it to keep it from moving. And that's why if you have the diagnosis of a scaphoid waist fracture, generally they'll go in and, and uh, realign it and put in a Herbert screw or something like that, internally fix it so that, so that you don't have motion and it allows it to heal. When, when you're evaluating non-union on CT, Okay, I mean, how much bridging callus is enough to say, okay, this isn't non-union? Any bridging callus means that it's that uh, that it's in the healing process, and I wouldn't, if you see any bridging callus at all, I would not call it a non-union. A non-union, you have to have sclerotic margins and no bridging callus. It's almost like a pseudoarthrosis. Yeah. So it's like yes, it's a pseudoarthrosis. Now you can have an incomplete union where you have a where you have bridging callus, but you don't think it's enough to really be stable considering the forces that might be on that bone. And occasionally in situations like that, uh, you have to be concerned that the patient may be at risk for future fracture. And that can be a problem in athletics. I, I know several, in fact, we'll see some in the wrist where there are injuries, but they healed with very little bone bridging and we were very concerned that if they went back into their activity again, that they could they could cause a fracture. But uh, but you just need to describe that. Yeah, but typically, I won't say typically, but oftentimes you can have a very stable healed fracture that doesn't have a hundred percent bony bony fusion across the fracture line with persistent sclerotic or granulation. You don't need a hundred percent. You often don't in some bones, depending upon the anatomy. Okay. Uh, I think somebody just joined us. Let me just check here. Aha, we can pick on somebody else here. Okay, Sheila, why don't you take this case? We're talking about bone injuries to the shoulder. No, Sheila? Okay, Aran, why don't you take this? So, two coronal views of the shoulder um, through the level of the supraspinatus insertion. Uh, there is increased signal at the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon with some irregularity of the underlying greater tuberosity. Um, possibly some erosion change, partial tears with like associated erosions. Um, yeah. I mean, the glenoid, yeah, okay. All right, looks like there's a, Defect of fracture line with associated sclerotic margins associated with the. Where are we there? I guess the spine of the scapula. Yeah. In my experience, by far the easiest fracture in the shoulder to miss are the, are the scapular fractures. So if there's a question of trauma, you have to force yourself to go back at the end and look at this at the scapula, because our eyes tend to go toward all the structures we normally see: the slap tear here and the the uh, supraspinatus insertional partial tear and all the other stuff that's going on here. And sometimes the elephant in the room will just go by uh, and missed. So, so just remember, if there's a concern of trauma, in this case, it was an 80-year-old female with shoulder pain, limited range of motion. So maybe you weren't thinking of trauma. You're probably thinking about supraspinatus tendon tear. But uh, scapular fractures are very easy to miss. Uh, 
and they can be very obvious, like in this particular case. One month. Doesn't take too long to, to uh, for this to happen. <clears throat> Sheila, have you joined us? Okay. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Just a text to Sheila. Yeah. So Sheila says that uh, she can't speak because she's in a room where they, she can hear us, but she can't use it. Okay, we have a 74 year old male. <laughs> pain after trauma and we have marked abnormal signal that's crossing the metaphysis and the epiphysis of the humerus and also adjacent soft tissue edema and signal changes as well um, after trauma. So on the T1 image I see a linear low intensity line going through the anterior portion of the humeral head here corresponding to the areas of abnormal signal there so I think this is a this is a, a fracture there through the, uh, oh, and then this is a follow-up examination. Okay, so, so this is 10 5 10, 74 year old. Okay. So this is 74 year old with trauma, but if this were a 74 year old with trauma and you see a fracture like this, the first thing I would be concerned about is could this be a pathologic fracture in someone of this age? Because this looks like very homogeneous material, and it looks like it's breaking through the cortex, extending to the outside. So we followed the end of the patient, and here's what the patient looked like on 125.11, which uh, you know, maybe three months later. Yeah. So we have progression of the signal abnormality extending to encompass most of the uh, humeral head now, and there's even more soft tissue density outside of the cortex um, or the bone as well, and um, sort of a loose fragment of the humor ahead there. So I would also yeah, be concerned for a neoplastic process here. And now we have kind of curvilinear lines. Uh, yeah, post-traumatic. Post-traumatic avian. This turned out not to be a pathologic fracture. This is a fracture going kind of through the uh, anat anatomic neck. And then, okay, there we can see it there. But now what we have, this is a little fragment here that has a double line side. So this is kind of characteristic of what an AVN would look like. And she developed AVN here distal to the fracture uh, at the, in the head of the humerus. So. So this is the fracture that's healing, and this is an area of AVN that developed that was normal before. So with fracture, one of the things that can happen is you can get areas of avascular necrosis, which is what this is. So that would be one of the complications in the healing process, uh, just like you would have in the proximal pole of the scaphoid in the wrist that we'll talk about. You can occasionally get it elsewhere when the fracture uh, uh, decreases the vascular supply. And here's another example, a uh, fracture here in the, in the neck of the uh, humerus and the development of AVN in the superior part of the head. So uh, I don't think this is talked about that much in the shoulder, but uh, we've seen a number of examples where you can get it. Now, <clears throat> here's a patient who also has the typical findings of AVN with double line sign. This one looks more chronic with with probably some collapse and so forth. Uh, Susie, wh 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 what do you think about when you see this? In regards to what do I think about it? Well, if the patient has been using a lot of um, steroids, if they've had some kind of accident and They've lost the onychosis from that, or they've actually got a So there's a typical differential you go through if somebody has AVN, you know, pancreatic disease, steroids, and so forth. But in the humeral head, one of the more common, especially around here, causes of AVN, not actually in this individual, but, but always think, this is probably post-traumatic, but always think about Quesson's disease. If you're around the uh, around here, 
a lot of people, there are a lot of people who are skin or divers and you can get diving accidents. And the humeral head is one of the most common locations to get infarcts if you actually get the bends. And here's a professional diver and these are all residuals of infarcts in the, in the humeral head from, uh, from diving accidents. This side. Okay. Okay. Case that it was originally described in people who worked on bridges, like the building the Brooklyn Bridge, and they had spent long periods of time down in the caissons, building the caissons for the bridge supports under high pressure, and then they would come up and decompress very rapidly, and then they develop a, a carbon uh, or nitrogen in the in the in the in the blood that would then have microemboli to the small areas and they would get uh, infarcts and that's called caisson's disease because it was in caisson workers. So uh, Haram, what do you think of this case? So two coronal views, I don't know. The proximal humerus looks okay. There may be increased signal in the, you know, the distal, distal acromium. It's hard to tell. I'm not sure how much we're seeing as artifact in edema. And there's probably low signal in the, in the, in the glenoid. So, no, some irregularity there. Maybe a fragment. I'm just trying to emphasize, but sometimes you only see it on one image. You, so you always want to look at the axials. But I just want to point out that these are very easy to miss. So you yeah, have to go back and look. Even big ones, it's amazing how easy they can they can go by. So just want to point that out. Here's an, and here's a scapular fracture down here. Again, this could, if you don't look for it, it would be easy to miss this big scapular fracture down here. I don't have these. Okay. Okay, Michael. Oh, I'm sorry, Sean, why don't you take this one? Um, okay, um, a <clears throat> single view of the right shoulder, and um, it looks like he's fairly externally rotated, and uh, now that he's internally rotated, um, the other, okay, there's several months apart, and it looks like there's a little bit of uh, lucency with some purple sclerosis near the uh, superior lateral humeral head, but that just might be the way he's rotated. Um, yeah, and this, yeah, is, right this is probably the bicipital groove where they're, yeah, know, yeah. Through, so that's probably external rotation there. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm not seeing a whole lot except for that. And now on the axial images, there is a erosion and defect in the lateral superior humeral head. Um, and there is edema within the um, rotator cuff. Um, and probable. What's uh, this? Well, uh, that's probably an avulsion fragment, uh, part of an avulsion fragment at the insertion of the right. um, rotator. So cuff. that's that's a greater tuberosity avulsion injury. Yeah, exactly, like we we're talking about before. Okay, uh, so I just wanted to go through some of the bony injuries that that you can have uh, in the shoulder. Now I'd like to talk about a chromioclavicular joint disease. And uh, the classic classification is a Rockwood classification, and this is pretty a pretty universally used classification. Uh, again, it probably be best not to use it, though. Since this is so universally recognized, I will typically use this in, in a report, though I probably shouldn't. But uh, almost everybody knows what a type three means, and. Uh, uh, type 3 means it may or may not be surgical. In these, this day and age, most people are conservative with these. In the past, people were more aggressive surgically, but not anymore. 
the type four, five, and six are all surgical lesions. So let's go through what these look like. And if you see here, uh, the things you need to look for are the AC joint, the chromoclavicular joint, you have to look at that. But the key here are the uh, corcoclavicular ligaments. They're really what determine what you do with the patient. And <clears throat> so we, we have capsular ligaments around the chromium and, uh, and CA ligaments. And then we have two CC ligaments, uh, the coronoid and let's see, well, let's see. So uh, one is more rectangular shaped and one is more like a cone. Uh, so there are two ligaments here. We can typically see those on MRI examination. So it's very important, I believe, that uh, the, when you do MRs of the shoulder, the sagittal images have to come through the CC ligaments because the sagittal images are very good images to see these. You can also see them on the coronal, so you also have to make sure that the coronal immediately extends to the CC ligaments. So the normal and type 1 have very similar appearance on an MR examination. Here's the sagittal images. This is the uh, cor cor cord tip. This is the clavicle. That's the, the CC ligaments. And usually you can see that the two, the medial and the lateral one, uh, uh, now, here's a coronal images where we see a lot of edema in the area of the acromioclavicular joint around the distal clavicle, and that's typical of a type 1 injury without any displacement. But if you actually look at a large number of people who have MRs that come in for shoulder pain that don't have a history of recent injury and don't have tenderness to the, to the uh, acromioclavicular joint, you'll see a lot of edema in the distal clavicle and the acromion process and some edema in the surrounding soft tissues, so it's not a very specific finding. So this is often said you can see this in normal as well as type 1 injuries. But if you see it and the CC ligaments are intact, the capsule looks uh, maybe uh, uh, a little bit of signal around the capsule, then you can certainly be concerned about a type 1 lesion. And it's not a big deal. I would describe it, you could raise the question, because it's treated conservatively. So it doesn't really change the management of the patient, though it might explain what the symptoms are. And here's a case where we can see fluid within the acromioclavicular joint, and we can see some extending superiorly, maybe probably through a tear in the capsule, and then extending more proximally along the distal end of the clavicle. This is a little bit more specific finding when you see actual fluid going through a, a tear in the capsule. No, no abnormal separation here, no inferior displacement of the uh, acromion process. The CC ligaments over here are intact, so this would be typical of a type 1 uh, Lockwood uh, type 1 injury. And here we can see a little bit of injury to the bone in this particular case. The bone injury. And on the sagittal images, uh, we could follow it. And sometimes if the CC ligaments are small, uh, you, they, they're at an angle, so you have to follow it on multiple cuts on the sagittal plane and then also on the coronal plane, but this was intact. So, and there we can see the, the, uh, the trapezoidal and the coronoid components of the CC ligament. And this was a type 1 injury from a football player. This comes from a paper we published in Skeletal Radiology a few years ago where we did imaging on a bunch of... Uh, Ironman athletes in Hawaii after they finished. And then uh, uh, we did the imaging first, but at the same time, clinicians took uh, history of, in those individuals to see who was symptomatic and who wasn't. And almost all of the Ironman athletes, we found edema with at the, oh, on either side, in the bones on either side of the AC joint. Uh, and it turned out that this did not just differentiate those who were symptomatic from those who weren't symptomatic. And then we, we looked at a number of, quote, controls, that is, people who were non-athletes who got MR scanning of their shoulder for rotator cuff tears and uh, other uh, uh, clinical finding, rot either rotator cuff or labral tears. And we found this was also a very common finding in uh, individuals who were not associated with high level of sports activities or trauma. So... The edema in the bones of the AC joint is a little bit nonspecific, uh, and most of the people who have it don't have symptoms there, and it's not treatable. So if you see it, you can comment on it in the body of the report. I don't put it in the impression 
unless there's a strong clinical suspicion that there's trauma to this area. Here's a 36-year-old weightlifter with shoulder pain. Now here what we can see are erosive changes similar to that hockey player that we saw earlier. Uh, this is more post-traumatic osteolysis, but we can see some separate, a little bit of separation here in the joint space, a lot of irregularity to the, to the articulating surfaces on either side. So this is a situation and the CC ligaments were intact. The capsule looks like it's grossly intact, a little bit of edema adjacent to the bones. This is more likely gonna be a post-traumatic osteolysis, which really are, are injuries to the, to the uh, articulating surfaces and then they, they, they heal this. So it's a basically fra fractures of the articulating surfaces, which when they heal, you get a resorption of the dead bone in the healing process and eventually laying down of new bone at that, at that space. Again, the treatment for this is conservative treatment. So type two is where the, you have a rupture of the acromial clavicular uh, joint capsule and, and ligaments and sprain of the uh, CC ligaments. So you have a rupture here and sprains of the CC ligaments. So here's an example where we can see a lot of abnormal signal intensity involving the capsule here. You may get a little bit of separation at the, at the joint space, usually less than a centimeter in these individuals. And then you have to look at the, you have to look for the CC ligaments. And here we're just seeing a little bit where we're seeing a lot of edema in the area of the CC ligaments. Here's another type two where we can see fluid extending through a rent in the superior capsule there. And then if we go to the CC ligaments, we can see a lot of edema. In this particular case, there was uh, edema in the trapezoidal portion and the conoid portion looked like it was more normal. So this is a sprain of the CC ligaments. So it'd be a typical type two. Another case, rotator cuff tear, a little bit of separation and a tear of the uh, AC uh, ligaments and sprain of the CC ligaments as well. Here's a 13-year-old male with a sports injury. See a lot of edema surrounding the distal clavicle. We can see a lot of fluid here with a separated AC joint. And you can see a little bit of abnormal signal intensity within the CC ligaments here. So this was also a rock wood type two. Now type three, or where you have ruptures of the AC ligaments, with usually with separation up to about a centimeter, uh, and ruptures uh, the CC ligament ruptures. Now you can you can have a little you can have just inferior displacement of the acromioclavicular joint in, in a type three. Typically, it's less than a centimeter, uh, <clears throat> but you have ruptures of both. So here we have ruptures all the way across. If there's not much displacement on these, they're typically treated conservatively and they actually do pretty well. If there's a lot of separation, then you have to treat these surgically and you treat it surgically by some operations where you basically do grafts or uh, uh, grafting to replace the CC ligaments. And there are a number of different surgical techniques to do this. All of them have some risks because if you just put tape around the bones here, tends to saw through the bones. If you tend to put uh, tunnels in, especially the clavicle, it's a small bone, you can get a fracture of the clavicle in that location. So, so there are a number of different surgical techniques. Most of them actually do pretty well. But here's a case where you can see significant separation of the acromioclavicular joint. Uh, uh, we can see a little inferior displacement of the acromion with respect to the distal clavicle. And you can see that there's a complete rupture of the CC ligaments here. So it's, uh, it's really up to the clinician and the patient as to whether these have surgery. Again, in my experience, most of these, if they're separated to this extent, most of them are treated conservatively, but this is an area that would, it would be controversial. Are we seeing both of the, are we seeing both bands of the coracochromial ligament there? In this case, yes, but you'd have to go back and forth through all the slices to convince yourself that that's the case. And there's a sagittal where you can go all the way through it. And this was a complete rupture of the CC ligaments. So typical findings in a type three lesion. Here's a hockey player who has imaged during the Stanley Cup playoffs, actually in the, the final series. 
and you can see a uh, separation here, the AC joint, uh, a lot of fluid going through a capsule rupture, just like we've been talking about here. And here you can see a complete rupture of the CC ligaments. Maybe a little bit of the conoid is still intact, but essentially a type 3. Uh, he was actually treated conservatively, continued to play through the next three or four games uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the time. And, you know, he's a hockey player. They can, they can play through anything. You can decapitate them, and they still play through. <laughs> it's uh, crazy some of the injuries that they have that they play through. But but anyway, uh, this was during the Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, they won. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, this wasn't the worst injury that occurred during the Stanley Cup playoff that the players played through. We'll see some of the others in other lectures. Here we can see a. Uh, uh, AC joint separation here, a little inferior displacement of the chromium process. In this case, however, there's actually a fracture of the of, of the uh, oops of the core cord process. I guess I should show some other images, but the CC ligaments were torn right in here. But in addition to that, there was actually a fracture of the core core cord process, which complicated uh, treatments in that individual. Yes. Sheila's no longer with us. Well, she Boy, she's awfully it. young to, <laughs> to no longer be with us. Okay. Well, good for her that she doesn't have to hear us. Okay. Yeah. Actually, uh, so uh, here's a, uh, another 18-year-old male with shoulder pain after trauma. And I think our time is about up. So... Why don't we stop here at, at type three rockwoods, and then we'll go through the higher grade rockwoods and talk about those that need surgery tomorrow. And John, your, your goodness will be with us here so we can talk a little bit more about the surgical treatment of these. So why don't we stop at this point and uh, carry through tomorrow. Any questions? All right, thank you everyone.